Recording started. All right, so welcome everybody to um, lecture number three for building sector management. Tonight we're going to do a, a short session. Uh, we're just going to touch on to the um, professional organizations and then touch uh, you know, onto the um, HR stuff, the soft and furry stuff that, that's always going to be with us. And uh, we're going to um, have a quick look around those. Only about 30 slides or so, um, which shouldn't take us longer than, say, 30 minutes or so to just go through everything. And then, of course, if you guys have any questions, um, you can ask away, and I'll try and answer your questions as best I can. All right, so at any point in time, you just go for it. All right, so just to make sure everybody can hear me okay, we'll just quickly go through the uh, slides, ago, uh, uh, slides again. So if you can give me a green tick to say, yes, everything is okay on your side so that I know everything is fine. All right, so there we go. All right, so all of you guys are on board, so that's a good thing. All right, so who's having trouble with the um, assessment item at the moment? Uh, red cross means no trouble at all. Uh, green tick means you're struggling a little bit to find the information. All right, so there we go. No problems from you guys. All right, so it seems I might have to work on that assignment for next year to make sure that it's a little bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, more about that later. All right, so everybody's still okay with using the interface. Um, so uh, Laughlin, that green tick of yours, was that green tick for um, showing that you have difficulties with the, oh yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, now, Josh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. No, mate, I just don't want you, to, want you to make it harder for the next year's students, mate. <laughs> oh, but it, it's, a, it's all right. You're not going to fail, are you, eh? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, uh, remember, I have to mark everything, so trust me when I say there's a method in my madness not to make it too much work, you know. So uh, at the end of the day, it's all about having fun and, and having that week or two off during December. I don't want to kill you guys, so we'll, we'll try and make it as easy as possible. Yeah, sounds good. Cool stuff. All right, so I take it everybody understands how to use the interface at the moment, so um, and you also know exactly how to use the uh, the uh, collaborate tools, so you can draw sketches and circles on the board if you like, um, so you guys can uh, manipulate the system easily enough, um, so that you um, you know can partake in this section. All right, so let's jump straight into the professional organisations. Uh, tonight's just going to be a short one. All right, so who belongs to a professional organization here? Green Tick says, yes, you belong to one, and Red says, no, you don't belong to anyone. All right, so Lachlan, you belong to one. All right, and also if you guys want to, you can um, use the little text tool to uh, put on the board which one you belong to. All right, so I belong to the AIB, um, so that's easy enough. Uh, it's one of the major ones in our industry. We can also, there's a, there's a few, I'm sure of you guys that belong to the ARBS. Um, I doubt if there's going to be anybody from the building designers. So Michael, what is the uh, BPB? Sounds like a Russian spying agency. All right, so we'll give you guys a, a few minutes just to, to uh, a few seconds just to type the, the answers in the chat window. Um, while I clear the board, so Michael, you don't belong to anybody at the moment. All right, so there we go. ARBS. Yep, that's a that's a, a regular one. We actually have the guys from the ARBS uh, in Rockhampton on the 25th and 26th. Um, all right, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, they are a spying organisation. Uh, yeah, and uh, the AIB. So yeah, basically a bunch of um, well, definitely the AIB and ARBS people that I know. Um, yeah. They, uh, they definitely know how to drink a glass of wine and enjoy a beer every now and again. All right, so uh, what do you guys find? What is the benefit um, from joining the AIB uh, or the AIBS, for instance? Do you get anything out of it? Is it, is it worth your while or is it just, do they just fill up your email with a bunch of uh, spam mail every now and again? or? Do they actually do something? Have, have some of you guys maybe uh, managed to get jobs through them? Yep, there we go, networking. All right, so that's a good one. Um, so networking would be, I think that would be the main one um, that I think you'll get out of it. Yeah, I mean, I belong to Timothy, I agree. Um, I, the, the stuff that I get from the ARB 
sometimes it's questionable. Um, the same with, I belong to another organization, PMI, and uh, man, they can send you lots of stuff that you just don't need. And um, at the end of the day, you don't read it. And it's the same with LinkedIn. All right, so who has got a LinkedIn profile? Green tick, LinkedIn profile, anybody? It's like Facebook for professionals, I guess. Um, I think everybody should have a LinkedIn at the moment. All right, so yeah, quite a few people that don't have it. That's interesting. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So um, maybe it's not as popular as I thought. Um, in real terms, also, I don't think uh, it's very useful. You uh, you do spend a lot of time on it. You don't get a much for it. Um, so the um, associations, basically, what we're going to look at is uh, what's the benefit? Um, what's LinkedIn? All right, so um, Benjamin LinkedIn is basically oh, that it's on the slide. I've got it there on the slide. It's a um, it's like Facebook for professionals. It's where you can go and set up a, a profile for yourself, and you can put uh, you know short little cryptic notes about your career and your CV, your qualifications, where you work, and stuff like that. And then you can start uh, networking with different people in the same industry. Um, you know, I'm on there, so um, you know I've got a few connections. And, and the moment you're connected to somebody, you can see their connections, and you know you sort of build up. And um, I must I must confess that. Uh, I'm not on there as regularly as I should, uh, but yeah, you do get networking opportunities. Um, yes, they do actually use LinkedIn. Um, there's a there's a few groups that that you know when, w once you've applied for a job, they'll go and search for you on there. Um, uh, there's also you know job groups and stuff. It's 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 very commercial, so at the end of the day, finding a job in our industry is, is more about the people that you know. Um, yeah, headhunters will use it, but I, I think to, to a great extent, it's all about the people that, that you know um, and um, you know the people that they know. It's not how nice your CV is or anything like that. It's always a, you know, one of the one and ten of the other. So uh, what's nice about LinkedIn is if you do apply for a job through LinkedIn, you can see how many other people have uh, applied for it. You know, so it shows you, you know, 27 other people have applied for this job, so you sort of know where you where you fit into the scheme of things. All right. So um, uh, typically the associations are not too expensive while we're students. Um, that's basically 50 or so dollars a year or so. But as you go up in the professional ladder. Um, and, and a few of you guys might have seen that survey that I sent out earlier this year in April and June um, about you know the progression, professional progression. So the higher you go in your membership, you know, so student or uh, yeah, I think it's student affiliate member, um, and then uh, fellow, and then life fellow. Um, obviously, the, the higher up you go, the more money you have to give them. Um, no real difference in benefits uh, except you know you, you get a little bit of status putting it behind your name. So, um, but yes, these professional organisations, there's a few few things that that they give us. Um, so it's networking, association with other people, uh, possibilities of work expansion, that type of thing. Um, that's going to be your main. And, and obviously, if you're struggling to find somebody that's an expert in a certain field. Um, that would be a good place to start. Um, there's also some really interesting um, interest groups um, for focused in interest groups on LinkedIn. Uh, I belong to a few of them, so oil and gas and procurement, construction procurement, those are the ones that I typically look in, into. So um, uh, in five minutes when I get into the office in the morning, I spend about five to ten minutes just going through it, just reading what the other people around the world have said. Um, seeing if there's anything interesting, and then you know maybe make a post onto it. So it's typically just the same as Facebook, but um, yeah. So uh, for these professional organisations, mainly I'll, I'll talk about the AIB and the ARBS. Um, they are you know based in the major cities, but they also have regional outreach offices. Now in the three and a half years that I lived in Rockhampton. Uh, I was the only one of two AIB members that was actually active in the in the region, so it makes it a little bit more difficult if you want to attend the CPD events and stuff like that because you basically have to fly and uh, you know fly somewhere, go and attend the breakfast, 
for an hour and then fly back again, you know, so it becomes really expensive. Uh, the closer you get to the metros, you know, obviously the more um, activity there is, you know, large construction companies, uh, the uh, AIB is really active in, in Brisbane, you know, they've got the Young um, Builders Alliance that's also happening, that's looking after students and um, mainly face-to-face -face students, so it's, it's quite difficult for our uh, our bunch, so basically distance students to fit into the whole scheme of things. It's not as easy when you uh, when you're sitting 500 kilometers away. So uh, different types: professional, commercial. Um, there's advisory groups, the interest groups we briefly spoke about, and then of course the industrial groups. So in there, also Engineers Australia, they would be there. Um, the uh, AIA would be there. Architects. Uh, they're also there, um, and they're very precious about uh, their membership and, and who gets to be an architect. Um, so, uh, you know, each, each of these organizations have a specific role to play. Now, if we look at the ones to, to join, I've given you guys a, a little uh, teaser there. There's the, um, the prices for the student fees. Um, so the AIBS, the last, last time I checked, that was still free. Uh, which was last week, the AIB is $45, but um, I've tried to negotiate with them, um, but what they say is you get a nice hard hat uh, in the deal, so uh, that's why they charge you $45 and a nice orange bib so that you can walk onto the site. As you can see, there's, uh, there's quite a few organizations that you can uh, join for free um, as a student. So, right? so the moment you finish your studies, it becomes more difficult because then they want to charge you for the CPDs and all of that stuff um, and it becomes more problematic. There's the um, PMI, the Project Management Institute. Uh, if you guys have any aspirations to go further, um, let's say for instance after your studies you want to go and work overseas for a few years, uh, maybe two or three, make a bit of money, uh, PMI isn't a bad place to go and have a look at. You can also do the PMP qualification. Uh, I wouldn't waste too much time on it. Uh, I would just get on a plane, use my passport, and go and uh, work in the Middle East for a while, um, make a few bucks on the side. So there's there's plenty of opportunities uh, for you guys over there, especially you young guys that's not um, really connected to uh, somebody at the moment. All right, so the uh, benefits. Uh, we've briefly spoken about those. Basically, the, the ones that we uh, we mentioned, Networking opportunities, I would put that one right at the top. Um, job hunting, um, not so much. All right, so the job hunting that I've my experience is with the ARB. Um, it's not as successful as, as you would think um, and it doesn't happen as easily um, as in the movies. All right, so it's not, it's not like the Freemasons or anything like that where they look after you uh, specifically, not that I know what's going on there, but um, uh, that's my understanding of it. Um, regular CPD events, so breakfast in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, any of those areas, uh, the, the closer that you get to a metro city, the more of those you'll see. And then of course, once a year they have international tours, study tours that they go onto. So the AIB this year, I believe is going to, or they went to New Zealand um, the last, the year before, they went over to China, so there's uh, there's quite a bit of, of travel up and down um, for them. All right, so uh, if we look at the role of these professional organisations, mainly it's about the profession. Um, so they're supposed to take our our battle for us, uh, represent us in in Canberra, you know, to Parliament, make sure that we. Uh, are seen as professionals, uh, look after licensing. So those of you guys who, who are with the AIBS, you know, the different levels of licensing that we have, open license or, or restricted uh, building surveyor license or building surveyor license, um, the professional standards. And in terms of the um, university, TEXA, uh, tertiary education qualifications now runs through TEXA. So uh, it's an authority set up by the government to look after the professionalism of universities or uh, the way that we teach. Um, so um, the professional organizations have a role to play because they can also now you know, provide accreditation to 
organizations and the government will take that accreditation into consideration when they look at the degree. For instance, the CQ29 Bachelor of Construction Management. I'm sure you guys saw that email that I sent out a while ago. We, uh, we recently went through that, so we've got that accreditation in the bag now. And uh, it, it's a good thing for everybody. The same with um, uh, building design and the same at the end of this month, we'll have the same for um, building surveying as well. Now there's a, a few commercial organizations as well, the master builders. Um, is anybody a, a member of the master builders um, or, or maybe the housing industry association? Anybody that's uh, associated with them? Um, Red Cross, no, or you can type in the chat. All right, so yep, there we go, the HIA. So these organizations, they, um, they really have fun stuff on their websites. All right, so if you need a short contract or if you need uh, you know, information on a specific technique or technology or something like that, they really sometimes have the, the nicest stuff on their website. Uh, recently, I was just looking for a, a straightforward um, you know, under $5,000 contract for a friend of mine, didn't want to go through the whole AS or the Australian standard thing and we just went through um, the master builders. Um, really easy, just download it, pay 20 bucks or so and there you go and uh, it's there. Now um, I did ask our friends at the AIB if they can give us a, a little bit of a slideshow or a presentation so quickly they gave us uh, basically six slides. So I'll just quickly run through those six slides so that you can see it. The other organizations didn't send it in time, so hopefully by next week we will have them. So there's our AIB um, slide presentation. And what it's all about is um, the AIB actually came about, um, it's, it's a chartered organization, so there's uh, a legal representation for it, the Act of Parliament, so it's there, it's by law. Um, and it's a, a professional industry body for construction professionals. Now um, that is of course how, <laughs> how professional you can be in the construction industry. Uh, sometimes I have to you know, just shake my head. Um, so Lachlan, the question that you ask, are those free uh, or are they cost involved? Are you talking about the um, commercial organizations? Are you talking about these? Um, no, there are fees involved, so you'll have to, you know, pay a fee to join up with them. All right, so um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the master builders are. Uh, I think they do have student prices as well, so you can uh, just go onto the website and um, uh, you guys should have access. Did, did everybody find these uh, slides in the download area? You should have been able to download it from the download area. Um, Oh, there we go. All right, so you found it from there. All right, so back to our AIB. Um, and there you can see, and, and this will be more or less the same for the AIBS, and it will be the same for the master builders. Uh, it's about that networking thing. All right, so networking, mentoring, teaching, getting the uh, industry professional, and then, you know, thinking about um, how can we make it better. Um, and of course, yep, I would say, Definitely, if you're looking for jobs, you know, maybe go to one of the cocktail evenings and see what you can see. Um, I've, 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 you know, quite recently met some uh, execs from Hanson Youngkin here in Sydney, so uh, it, it's really interesting to see how these guys think. And uh, at the end of the day, they're just normal people, and um, it's about that opportunity. It's if you're there when they are looking and you've got something to sell them, they'll buy it. All right, so. So the benefits uh, from the IRB, um, employment opportunities, uh, yep, you get invited to the uh, events. The events are not great. Who's been to an event of, of a professional organization? Green tick, yes. Red tick means no. Yep. All right, so there's a few of you guys who's, uh, who's been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sometimes I have to agree with you, uh, Timothy. But they do have for the for the student that achieves the highest um, uh, GPA in our program, they do have a nice uh, prize. You get you, you know, they fly you um, all the way to Brisbane because the function is in Brisbane every year, 
and it's a really grand function, and they uh, pay for your airfare and everything, and it's um, you know it's quite a nice event. So that's one of the small benefits that you can think about. Um, and there's of course uh, what the ARB thinks that uh, they mean to the members. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but basically there it says it's a body of knowledge, uh, and we can drag or we can go and, and try and see if we can. Um, get that information from somebody else. We don't have to reinvent the wheel and if you sort of get old, uh, let's say 65 or so, you start retiring, you can always get back into the industry by uh, giving back you know, through being uh, on the board of the AIB. Um, you have to really be um, a special type of person if you want to sit on this board though. And there we go, there's the um, website for the AIB. You guys can go and have a look there. Um, see if you want to join up with them. All right, so uh, that's basically all that I wanted to do about the professional organizations. I did give you guys some more information in the study guide, so um, happy hunting in the study guide. Uh, I don't think I've got any questions on the professional organizations in any of the assessment items, um, and um, I think I might just, in one or two of the quizzes, uh, that we've got later on, there might be a question about you know benefits and stuff like that. That you uh, that you can associate with the AIB. All right, so there we go. Um, let's move on to um, topic number five, and this is where we're going to briefly talk about the HR stuff, um, and and this might relay back to uh, some of the assessment items that you that you've got um, coming up in the next couple of weeks or months. All right, so if we look at the first slide, there, teamwork is. Um, and this, I know not everybody likes teamwork. Uh, teamwork is really difficult, especially when you work in a um, uh, class environment like, like we are. You know, so team uh, subjects or team group, group work is really difficult because you're far away and there's always the freeloader effect. You know, one person does everything and um, nobody else, uh, you know, they're just along for the ride and the one person that's really serious about the, uh, the result he does all the work or she does all the work. So um, many people says, many people say that there's uh, no real I in teamwork, but if you really look closely, you can see it, and there it is. Um, so it is a little bit of an individual sport as well. Don't let anybody else tell you anything else. Uh, you can definitely get away with uh, you know, motivating the team by being self-focused. Right, so don't be over focused on it, but there's definitely an opportunity for you to be focused on yourself and that way um, benefiting the team or the team management process. So when we start looking at the human resource management industry, it's all the soft stuff that uh, that goes around in projects. And I think last week I asked you guys what's what's more important, technical knowledge or um, the knowledge of how to work with people when it comes to the execution of big projects and working in our industry. So uh, in our industry, it's, it's a little bit of a mix, uh, and I'll wait for you guys to chat away, maybe in the chat box or pick up the uh, click on the talk button. But um, in our industry, there is a little bit of soft stuff, uh, but also a lot of shouting and screaming outside on sh on site because if you don't shout and scream, typically. Um, you're not always going to get exactly what you uh, what you need out there. Uh, who agrees with that statement? Who says yes? Um, you know, you need a little bit of authority outside on the site to make stuff happen. All right, so there we go, Ben. Yep, you say yes. Uh, anybody else? Hmm. Yep. There we go. All right. So there's a, there's a little bit of truth in there. Definitely, um, our industry is not IT. Uh, we are not nurses, you know, so, uh, and um, the other thing that I do see a lot of, um, and this is going to sound really sexist, <laughs> but the moment, uh, the moment the organization becomes big and there's a lot of um, time and females coming into, into play, uh, it seems to just roll on and suddenly there's a lot of politics. So human processes really starts happening. Uh, when we start getting big teams and big projects in there. Um, so from a management point of view, it's basically trying to um, 
make people do stuff that they don't really want to do and get them to enjoy it. Right? So trying to influence them, trying to maneuver around the difficult areas, identifying the risks and trying to um, see if you can. Uh, it's almost like moving chess pieces on the Titanic. You know, if you can move them fast enough, maybe you can win the game before the ship sinks. Um, so that's just one of the things that we have to think about. So if we look at the different uh, personalities and, and behaviors that we've got, there's, there's authors, uh, Blake and Mitton, and you guys will definitely do some research on that and uh, do a little of Googling on that. But there we go. That's basically um, what they said. There's the, the names of the authors. You guys can go and have a look at them. And they said that, you know, in terms of personalities and behavior, um, there's two things that we look at when it comes to work. Uh, and it's social and task orientation. So social or task. Now, um, basically what you want to think about is on this scale over here where the nine is, let's just put a nine there. That, that On that side, that's uh, highly social. And uh, let's, let's choose another color over here. Let's make it, uh, let's choose blue. All right, so there we go, blue over here, and that's task orientated. So um, the more you get to go to this side, the more task orientated you are. And of course, the higher you go, the more socially orientated you are. All right, so um, what I'll do is I'll go and see if I can select all of the areas that I've got on the board there. Um, if you think about yourself, where would you put yourself? Are you task orientated? Are you more social? Are you um, sort of a mixture like a 5.5 that sits in the middle? Um, or are you somebody that's uh, low on social and low on task orientation? So using your, mm, using your text box, where would you think you guys would sit? And I'm going to put myself somewhere there. I would say I'm around about there. So, yep, Mitchell is a 5.5. G. Laughlin, you're an 8.5. All right, so uh, yeah, there we go, 7.6. Um, I'm actually a, let's, uh, let's, let's think about it, so 6.5 to 3. Now let's go to three or four digits just to confuse everybody. So you can see there, um, typically, construction managers, uh, people in the industry are really well balanced. All right, so we'll typically fall uh, in this area where we can say, um, yeah, I think around right about there where the, where the red block is at the moment, we'll, we'll easily fit into that area because we know how to be social. Social is, is a real big part of our, our life. Um, you get a lot more done if you've got a good uh, social uh, rapport with your colleagues, um, but also you have to have that uh, really uh, task orientated um, outcome driven notion to get things done. All right, so I think my first boss told me that I'm not allowed to go and have drinks with the people on site um, because, you know, you tomorrow or if you get drunk with them, you know, tomorrow they won't respect you. So I must say in South Africa, it's a little bit different than in, in Australia. If you do get drunk in South Africa, it's, uh, it's a lot of liquor and, and there's possibilities of losing respect for anybody um, if that happens. I'm sure you guys have encountered similar uh, examples over the year as well. All right, so if we look at the, the next phase, is basically now starting to go into the leadership aspects of, of, of um, HRM, you know, human resource management. Now we start thinking about how do we lead people? And if we just jump onto basically the principles of leadership, um, so who thinks that leadership is built in? Can you teach somebody leadership? Who says yes? Green tick means yes, and a red tick means no, you cannot teach it. All right, so yep, Laughlin, you say no, you cannot teach it. Um, all right, and there we go. Um, Timothy, you say yes, we can. Matthew says yes. Leslie, you also say yes. All right, so somebody had their hand up. Um, did you want to say something, or was it by accident? Yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah, that's also true. Um, so yeah, we'll 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 talk about this one a little bit more. Um, we'll talk about can you uh, teach leadership? What about something? 
um, a little bit more topical entrepreneurship who who thinks you can uh, can you teach entrepreneurship uh, let's see if I can get it uh, in drip there we go entrepreneurship I'm not sure about the spelling there uh, what I'll do is I'll clear the panel so who says you can teach entrepreneurship all right so there we've got a few red crosses over there all right yeah it's Entrepreneurship, I think, is more a creative thing. So it's it's more the people, the right brainers. So uh, if you're a creative person, um, you know, it it's it comes more natural. Um, so that, yeah, interesting. Um, and I can see there's a few guys that's typing a little message there. So uh, I'll wait for those to come through. Um, all right, so I'll clear the board again and let's look at the next one there. What about management? Is management something that we can teach people? Can we teach people? management how to manage and how to deal with people all right so yeah there we go we've got a few green ticks on the board there uh, what would you say is the main component to make management uh, work what is the main component that you have to have before somebody becomes a good manager who wants to take uh, yeah you have to understand people um, how do you learn how do you learn how to understand people, Michael? So how would you think you would learn? And this is a, a real simple question, confidence, experience. All right, so there's the word that I was looking for, experience. Now it's all about that experience, the soft skills, and understanding how people think. And, and, and the way that you pick up those things is by being in that situation yourself. And of course, yeah, Timothy, very important one there, listening. Oh, that's uh, well, listening and actually comprehension of what other people say is a, a real important one. We've got some problems with that at the university at the moment. Um, experience, uh, there's some senior management uh, people that doesn't re really have the experience and you know they don't really listen. So, and it immediately comes through into the uh, management style. It's much more autocratic, but. Because they don't have that experience, understanding how people work and how people think, they uh, make the decisions without, uh, you know, taking into account um, the expertise of others. All right, so yeah, excellent stuff. All right, so um, leadership versus management. Um, uh, we'll talk about accountability and responsibility later on. Again, uh, it's all about leading by that example. You know, listening, taking the other people's uh, reputation and experience into consideration. Uh, you don't need to be an expert in everything. You surround you with experts. All right. um, just when you when you build your team, uh, would you rather have a, a, a A class team and a B class opportunity, or would you rather go for a B class team and an A class opportunity? Right. So those are the, are the options that you have to ask. You know. So uh, typically. It's all about the team, so make sure you choose the right people in there. All right, so uh, there are three leadership styles um, that that we just briefly going to touch on: X, Y, and Z. Not going to spend a lot of time over there, but there is basically the authoritarian one, uh, and this is the shouter and screamer on site, um, and automatically, um, I think back on the days when I was. Uh, a young site agent on site. My foreman was uh, really sure about himself, and he made sure everybody else knew about it. And uh, he could make people do stuff that they uh, didn't really like. Um, and and until well, to, to this day, Friday afternoons, I dislike being at the office. But this guy just managed to do everything on a Friday afternoon. I have meetings at four o'clock. Um, and those meetings would keep on going until about 7, 8.30 at night uh, on a Friday. So, uh, yeah, I never never really liked him. But there you can see there's uh, the assumptions. They automatically think people are lazy, uh, don't want to take responsibility, nobody wants to make decisions. Uh, so uh, because they make these assumptions about people, it's difficult for them to delegate as well. Uh, so you can see there's the direct style and the supervision is very strict and autocratic. Uh, if we look at the uh, participative uh, or theory why, uh, it, you know, it's, it's basically the opposite. 
this one now assumes that everybody is responsible for their own decisions and they are going to be enthusiastic and they're going to be able to make these decisions uh, on their own and they are you know, keen to perform. So um, let me clear everything on the board there again. So if we look at these two, theory X and theory Y, which of these two would work the best for, let's say, a construction company? Which of these two would work best for a construction company? This is basically a oh, crossbreed, interesting. All right, so um, now, of course, you have to elaborate on that. Uh, that's always part of the trick. You have to uh, sort of think about it and now um, talk about it some more. So, uh, Timothy, you said a participative uh, style would work for a construction company. Um, are you in a company that uh, that uses that management style at the moment? It's interesting um, um, to see the different types of approaches that, that you guys encounter. I'm sure uh, even even if we look at the number of people in the class, right, there's going to be different ones. Um, all right, so there we go. Collector IQ is big in our company. All right, so that's interesting. Uh, obviously, you guys, uh, is it a young and progressive company or have they been around for a while? Uh, all right, and Benjamin, you've also made a good point there. Uh, yep, short sighted, top down. Mm, right, yep, get, get the people. So, yeah. So, Timothy, coming back to your company, five years, reasonably young company, so, um, you know, not old school. So, interesting to see how the different uh, leadership styles are uh, different in. in the ages of the companies. You know. So some, when you guys finish your degree, maybe uh, somebody wants to go and do a, a PhD, there is definitely a PhD in there as well. All right, so there's one more theory that we have to think about or, or quickly discuss, and this is uh, obviously the Japanese. Um, they, uh, they think about zero defect, and uh, you guys can go and Google um, Theory Z as well, and uh, you know, you'll find some uh, interesting reading about that. Also in the, the handouts and the study guide, I've made some notes about those. Um, these guys, it's all about, you know, Panasonic and Toyota and Nissan, uh, zero defect. The guys, I worked for Toyota for a, for a short while, and uh, they are really organized. They, uh, they will not uh, release schematics for a new model unless they can fit it onto an A3 piece of paper. Um, and that's, you know, very comprehensive schematic. So they, they really focused on, on getting that zero defect there. However, um, if you look at the um, number of recalls that we've seen from Toyota in the last couple of years, maybe there's some cracks in their style. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it up to you guys to decide on that. Who drives a Toyota? Green Tick says, yes, you've got a Toyota. Red Tick says, no, no for a Toyota. All oh, right, there we've got no, all right, so we've got, Mitchell, you've got a Toyota, um, but you live in far northern Queensland, so we won't keep that against you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the Toyotas are nice, but they, <laughs> they're very exp <laughs> expensive to, to buy. Um, I also have a Japanese vehicle, uh, so we'll talk about that one later. All right, so uh, if we, uh, all right, so at least it's a company car. Well. Any company car is four-wheel drive, so uh, that's good. Um, yeah, is, it a, is it a Japanese bike, Benjamin? Is it a Japanese bike or is it uh, locally manufactured? Um, all right, so moving straight along on to the, uh, you know, the leading professionals. Um, you know, these are basically the, the new developed uh, area. It's uh, more, you know, you guys as opposed to the foreman and the trade people in the old days. <laughs> sponsored by Toyota, of course. Um, so there's a whole new breed of people. It's, let's call them you know, Gen, Gen X or Gen Y. Um, that's, that's coming up the ranks. Um, and, and a lot of the older type guys in the industry now realize that they are being overtaken by the young guys with the Bachelor of Construction Management degrees. And, and you know, they come back to the university and they, they want to formalize their studies. Um, but it's difficult at the higher age. You know, once you once you're a, 
really senior in an organization, let's say you're 55 or older, it, it becomes um, quite difficult to come back to university and, and have that dedication to finish another seven years or another you know, four-year full-time degree. So um, they rely heavily on the younger professionals. Uh, so uh, the new management style is basically focused on uh, outcomes. All right, so more about you know what we want to achieve, and um, as long as we achieve it, you know everybody is happy. And, and to a certain extent, many of the companies that that operate in the industry focus on that. They uh, see a project as a small business unit, and they allow the business unit to operate as long as there's profit, as long as um, there's not serious uh, you know uh, health and safety issues or anything like that. Uh, you know, there's there's no no serious concern about that. But I see that so much in the construction industry, but basically uh, any other project orientated uh, organization or project orientated industry uh, will have that. Uh, big on self esteem and professionalism. All right, so you'll hear the words expertise and professionalism uh, constantly, especially at the uh, cocktail parties when you go there. All right, so if we look at the management functions, and this is very similar, so I'll just briefly go back to our Blake and Mouton slide. So uh, there you can see it's it's more or less the same. All right, so let's see if I can draw a line there, if you allow me to just draw a line and a line there. Um, there we go, there's our four quadrants. All right, so if we go back to our management functions again, there's our four quadrants again except in this case we are now focused on the relationship behavior and also the task behavior. And here you can see um, the different areas where um, we're looking at the maturity of the task behavior in relation to the relationship behavior. All right, so we've got different options. Is it going to be um, high relationships and low tasks over here in quadrant number B? Or is it going to be quite immature where it is very focused on just the task and not so much on the people? All right, so that's see you can see there the, the little sweet spot in this one is more or less there um, where things come together. There's a basic balance. Let's see if I can move that a little bit to that side. And uh, let's see if I can grab it like that. And move it like that. So there you can see it's that's 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 more or less the sweet spot. What I wanted to show you in this graph is that uh, the moment you move to an area where there's high task and high relationship, as well as um, a high level of maturity in terms of the task behavior, that's where we want to be in terms of management functions. All right. Um, any questions so far? Any questions from anybody? Red cross means no. Red, uh, yellow, uh, green tick means yes. Question, or you can just type it into the uh, chat box. All right. So doesn't look like anybody's got any questions. I must have bored you guys already. Um, all right. So almost there. Let's move on to the next one. Um, who's heard of Maslow before? Yep, so Maslow has been around for ages, right? so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but basically the hierarchy of needs is, uh, is all about people, um, and there you can see there's a, there's a very important one down there. Um, the basic psychological stuff needs to be satisfied before you can move up to the more important stuff, and this is of, of course also where, you know, remember last week when I spoke about communication, um, you know, you must make sure that you maintain those those open levels of communication. Otherwise, there's a suspension of services, and you cannot move on to the next level. All right. So safety and security, and then of course social. Um, that's where the friendship and all of that stuff comes into play. And then once you reach this level, the self-actualization. This is where uh, it might be an area where, uh, let's say, for instance, you you are being headhunted by somebody and you decide to decline uh, to take an offer. Now typically uh, a good reason for declining an offer is that you are, uh, you've arrived where you want to be. I mean, you might be in your own organization, you might be a very senior person in that organization. Um, it might not be necessary for you to move on. You know? So different things 
characterizes different levels of self-actualization for people and it's not the same for everybody. So it's basically an individual thing. Um, whatever makes you tick at the end of the day is what's important. So Maslow had a friend, um, Ardeford. And so what I've done there is you can see there is I've tried to um, basically link the existence relatedness growth theory um, opposed to um, Maslow's need of, of or Maslow's levels of need. And there you can see Maslow's basically, oh, I won't be able to do it with that little box. Let's see if I can uh, do a pen. And there we go. There's our deficiency needs. I might choose a different color. Yellow doesn't really work for me. Let's choose blue. There's our growth needs over there. All right, so you can see that looks a little bit like a heart. It's not supposed to look like a heart unless you're on Facebook. But there we go. So different levels. And, and these theories have been around since the 50s. Um, so it's not new stuff, and yet it is still... Um, in existence today, it still it still has application. All right, so remember the the top levels there, the self actualization, self actualization. Um, as soon as you've got that esteem, um, you'll start moving into the growth area over there on Ardiffer's theory. All right, so more stuff in the um, uh, study guide. You guys can go and read about it. Um, who of you guys also have construction management one? Of you guys also have construction management one. So Mitchell, you've got it. Yep. All right. So is it under you? All right. Shemaine, I see, isn't here tonight, so she's also good. But this is a good slide that shows project manager authority. So, um, and this is based on the three levels of of authority that a, a project manager, uh, <laughs> a project manager will have. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, you guys might have seen this somewhere. Um, I might have shown you. Um, what I do is I, I just grab slides and create ones, and you know, so there might be a little bit of a mix and match. But this is this is a good. There's three levels of authority that project managers typically have, and um, you know, the one is basically the legal one. You know, this is because of their position, um, the policy that supports them. Um, maybe the delegation that they've received from the board of directors or anything like that. Um, if you run an NEC or a new engineering contract, the project manager is mentioned in the contract, so it's 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 a definite power that he's got. He is, um, you know, the most senior person in the contract um, that takes care of things. Um, then, of course, also uh, the reality. You know, so this is because of the experience. You know because he's been around the block, because he or she has been around the block, um, many, many projects behind the back, and you know, they've, they've constructed projects to the millions of dollars, you know, so that, that brings uh, extra weight into that authority level. They know what's going on. You can't pull a sock over their head. You can't keep them for a fool. And then, of course, uh, the last one there is just the project charter authority. Uh, and this is because of their position as well. So these two, um, basically, the, these two are very close together. And this one over here is sort of to the side. And you can see there that the factor is, is something that you will only pick up after many years of experience. While the other two, you might be able, as a young guy, get that because of your position. All right, so because you mentioned in the contract, because it's part of the procedure, uh, you might be able to get those, and you'll have to work really hard to get the um, de facto power, the, the uh, reality, that uh, technical knowledge. All right, so you guys might have to think about that one a little bit. Um, all right, so when we look at the interpersonal influences, all right, different types of, uh, of uh, power that we can can exert. We're not going to spend too much time on this tonight, but there's basically uh, penalty power. All right, so let's say we are going to do a, a KPI or a KPA or something like that. Who of you guys do um, key performance um, or performance reviews every year? Anybody do key performance or performance reviews every year? All right, it, it's very, very commonly used in the industry to determine bonuses and 
professional development. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I think um, you know there's a few holes in that theory. Um, so, but that's just my personal experience. Um, so, um, but yeah, there you can see there's different levels of power that you can use as a project manager. And uh, of course, there's our expert power because of the knowledge we have and uh, reward power goes without saying. Um, these days it's a little bit more it's a little, little bit more difficult to use the reward power thing because it's um, you know everything is very strict, very controlled. So yeah, that's that's right, Benjamin. It's it's so it's very one sided. Um, if you if you find you are off sides with your boss, um, it becomes a difficult um, you know, it becomes a difficult situation because now suddenly um, he's just going to keep you on uh, a short leash. leash. So uh, yeah, makes it interesting when we get to those levels. All right, so the authority, um, and this is just a, a little sketch, um, try and explain it. So basically, um, the key thing here is authority without the power is not. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't really help. The same thing is happening in lots of organizations where you've got a lot of responsibility or a lot of accountability, but you don't have any authority. Right? So when, when you're made responsible and accountable for, you know, performance on site or, you know, reaching deadlines, making sure that the subcontractors deliver on time, making sure that the procurement is, you know, uh, within the allowed budget, all of those things, uh, if you don't have the authority to actually make the decisions or to apply punitive action, it's not going to work. Right. So make, always make sure that you might, you know, sort of negotiate those things uh, beforehand. When we talk about the um, motivation of personnel, um, and, and most of you guys are already in this position where you're working in a sort of a management position where you have to uh, manage and talk to your people that's working with you. Um, talk about the opportunities that they might have. Uh, talk about uh, what's going to happen down the line. What downstream projects do we have? Uh, what's the long-term view? Um, the people are very, at the moment, when we think about the economic environment, everybody's quite scared. Um, jobs are not that secure, that safe anymore. Um, and people do move around. All right. So the, the era where we stayed in the same job for 25 years, that's long gone. Uh, for a project manager, I would say um, if you are uh, in a position you have longer than six years, it must be a really, really good position or it might be time for you to move on um, to go and try and get some more expertise. You, know, you become very focused if you stay in the same company. Um, and, and sometimes it's it's necessary for you to actually leave a certain company to be promoted to do the next one. Uh, the same with with the university, for instance. You know, uh, most probably if I want to get promoted to um, the next level, uh, it's going to be really difficult. But uh, most probably it won't happen at this university. It might happen at another university. So talk about the long down the line type stuff. That's that's where the soft stuff comes into play. Um, there's our teamwork again, right? That family feeling when it comes to these organizations. Um, always interesting to see how you make it happen. Um, and then, of course, the Peter Principle. Who knows what the Peter Principle is? Um, has anybody heard of the Peter Principle before? Now, if you haven't, it doesn't matter. But the Peter Principle is just, um, it's uh, basically, uh, putting people in positions beyond their level of competence. All right, so that is uh, somebody might be a really good foreman, and you think, gee, okay, well, it's better, you know, it's, it's time for, for us to promote this person, and you promote him to a, a you know contract manager or project manager, and it's a total stuff up because you've moved him out of his level of competence too quickly without the necessary training and uh, it, it falls over. So uh, you guys can go and Google it. It's called the Peter Principle, um, and it, it's quite well known. Peter, uh, it's not Peter Drucker that came up with it, um, so maybe by the end of tonight I'll remember uh, what Peter's surname is, 
um, from the 60s management guru that came up with, with that. And it's actually really true. And you see it in day-to-day -day business quite often, uh, especially in our industry. Um, all right, so uh, when we talk to uh, our own personnel, uh, and even when you talk to your boss, all right, so um, I'm sure, uh, who, does anybody work for FKG here? I read somewhere in the student introductions a few notes about FKG. So there we go. Um, you work with an old school buddy of mine um, that played a joke on me the other day. I was quite upset about that. Yeah, Josh, that would be um, Jan Kruger, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's him. Yeah, I've got his number. You tell him that. I'm going to catch him out someday. Yeah, no, um, he's, he's always asking me about you, so he's yeah. always um, yeah, he's always wondering what you're up to. He's um, yeah. Towards the end of the session, I'll talk about John. He's a he was a big guy. I'm sure he's still big. I haven't seen him for ages, but he was a big guy when we were still at school. And he had this uh, this Volkswagen Beetle, um, and this uh, it was purple, and he had the biggest rear wheels on this thing. It's just, it looked like a you know, <laughs> toy car. I'll, I'll see if I've got a photo somewhere of it. He's, he's, he's mentioned the um, the car itself being a V dub, um, Josh, but he's never mentioned the color. Like he didn't tell me it was purple. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it was purple. And just you know, the rear wheels was like, you know, three <laughs> times the size of the front wheels. You know, so. Um, yeah, no, he's a good bloke. <clears throat> yeah, he. Um, incidentally, also like myself, we struggled to uh, to pass structural forms and analysis. Um, the first time round, you know, so um, it wasn't an easy course for us as well. So, but yeah, Jan's a good guy. He's got a sense of humour. So it's always yeah. good to have people on their side. Not too many people right. get that sense of humour, but no, no, yeah, it's so important. You know, you have to, you have to be able to make a joke with yourself every now and again. Um, otherwise, life is just too short, and you just become grumpy. So uh, yeah, keep it, uh, keep that uh, sense of humor in there. All right, um, and, and then of course I see there I've, I've been politically incorrect. That should be he or she. So just make sure that you guys um, um, come to the party there. Um, all right, so we're honest appraisals. All right, without being abrupt or aggressive, you can tell people, uh, you know, it's not the best effort, but you know. Um, we need some work in this area, and, and they they do appreciate that there's there's good ways of saying bad things, and there's bad ways of saying bad things. So uh, you know, always choose the lighter side, and if you can work a little bit of humor in there, that sort of always makes it easier at the end of the day. Now, when we talk about this, is obviously for internal personnel, but as a project manager, many times you guys will be involved with uh, external members as well, so you'll have to talk to them about you know, how do they feel into or how do they fit into the team. Um, so there's different ways of, of talking about that, so the approval and acceptance and you know, their input into the team, recognition for their great efforts, uh, um, you know, that satisfaction that you can, that you, it's, it's all about you know, when you, when you talk to your boss as well, you know, polishing the model, um, you know, make them feel good um, because that just it just goes a long way if you can grease the wheels and you know, just um, have powerful allies. Make sure that you have powerful people upstairs that, that really like what you're doing um, because that comes uh, into play when the trouble hits the fan. Um, yeah, make sure that you also challenge people. Don't, you know, just keep them on uh, for small jobs and stuff like that. All right, so team building principles, not going to talk about this too much. Uh, security and protection, we spoke about that. Clear direction, really roles and responsibilities. I cannot say enough about roles and responsibilities. What's missing? Um, what's missing from this one? Anyone? What's missing from our list of team building principles? Who wants to take a stab at this? I've just seen it. Um, it's something we spoke about last week as well. Let's see if I can. Got a few people typing some messages there. Ownership, yeah, that's ownership can go in there. 
Well, it's not, uh, let's see if I can add it in here. All right, so uh, I'll type it in. All right, so there's ownership. Who else? Understanding. All right, and not yet the one that I was looking for, but all good. Unless I'm, um, yep, it's definitely not there. No, no, no. We're still missing one. All right, so communication is the one that I was looking for. Um, Benjamin, you're still typing, so um, yeah, we'll wait for yours to come through. I can see, well, it looks like you're still typing a message there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the things that, that's uh, important for us uh, at the end of the day. Um, in terms of teams, it's all about that uh, you know, um, kickoff party, making sure there's a few drinks around the table, get everybody um, up to scratch where they want to be. All right, so um, something else that you guys might encounter is that you are overworked, you've got too many responsibilities and accountabilities, therefore you might have to delegate this. So when it comes to uh, responsibility and accountability, can you delegate accountability? All right, so can you delegate accountability? Who says you can delegate accountability? Anyone? What's your feeling on accountability? So let's put the words on there. Uh, I think I misspelled that. And let's put the other one there. Oh, gee, I'm terrible with spelling. Um, all right, so there we go. So Timothy, you reckon if a procedure is in place, yes, you can. Uh, Benjamin says, yes, in a legal sense, you can. All right, so, uh, and Michael, you say, no, you cannot delegate um, not sure which one, but I can see you typing a message there. Um, if you delegate to someone not up to the task, all right, that becomes a problem. All right, so the reason why I put um, accountability on top of responsibility, there you can see there's um, in the alphabet, A sits on top of R. All right, so that's an easy way to remember it. So accountability cannot be delegated. Right? So you cannot account, you cannot delegate your accountability um, to anybody. You you remain that remains with you. So as a manager, you keep the accountability. What you can delegate is you can delegate your responsibility. Right? So you can um, play around with your responsibility a little bit, and you can pass that on to a few people. Right? So. And you'll have to do that because you'll have too many activities and jobs and stuff to do. But be careful. There is some weaknesses when it comes to delegation. All right. So if you are going to be the manager, you have to let go. All right, if you don't let go, it falls over. And uh, we see this quite often in our industry. Um, people don't let go because they feel that they do the work themselves in, onto a better standard. All right, they're insecure about uh, the, people, the people's capabilities around them, or they might be perfectionists, but there again, the biggest one that we have there is inexperience. All right, so because they don't have the experience, they haven't come up through the ranks, they might be in a position where, let's call it the Peter Principle comes into play, they haven't worked with, with a team environment, um, they're inexperienced in letting go. All right, in that case, then delegation falls over because that manager then becomes micromanagement. Right? So he starts focusing onto it, and micromanaging never a good thing uh, in a big project. It just is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so if we look at the person accepting the delegation, the same applies over here. Um, if you don't have experience in the task that you're going to do, so that comes back to Michael's point where you say, uh, if you delegate to someone that's not up to the task, yep, that's a recipe for total disaster. And then, of course, incompetence. That's such a nice word, incompetence. You can say it 15 times, incompetence. And you just, round, you know, if you say it in Afrikaans, of course, tomorrow uh, you can ask Jan to say it. He's got a, I think he's, his accent is a little bit more aggressive than mine. Um, tell him I say that. But yeah, if you have uh, incompetent people around you, it always becomes an issue. And uh, there we go, overloaded. 
uh, let's say for instance we only have one horse, we overload that horse, um, you know, obviously it's going to fail. Something else that happens is you might have five people in your team and three of them work really good and two of them are really freeloaders. So what do you do? You take the work away from the freeloaders and you give it to the people that really perform because at the end of the day you want stuff to happen and you don't really want the hassles. And it's unfortunate that's just how it happens. I find I do it myself. I've got one or two staff members that I do it with. Uh, I end up doing more work. Other people end up, you know, end up doing more work because you just don't trust them to to take it on and to actually make a success of it. All right, so be careful of those weaknesses when it comes to uh, the delegation process. All right, so there's there's the third slide in terms of delegation. This one looks at basically our situation only, and. Um, there's our inexperienced thing again, a one-man show policy. So uh, if, if it's a, a micromanager that is going to try and keep um, control, obviously it's going to not be a successful delegation. Um, and there has to be some level of tolerance for mistakes. Right? So um, because of our different backgrounds, let's say for instance I take uh, Lachlan, Leslie and Michael and I put you guys in, uh, in the same room and I present you with exactly the same problem. And then I say, all right, go to each, you know, go to separate rooms and come back in five minutes with, uh, with uh, a solution for the problem that I've given you. So how many solutions do you think I'm going to get back after the first five minutes when I sent Lachlan, Leslie and Michael to, to those rooms? Anyone? Anyone wants to take this? Yeah, there we go. Because of, because they grew up differently, they're from different areas in the country. Um, somebody might have a lot of experience in this specific case, or somebody might not have. Yeah, so you're going to have three different, uh, you know, solutions to the problem. You know, so that's that's always going to be uh, an issue there. All right. So if we look at the team building indicators, there's a few negatives and positives. Um, all right, so it's always about that. Uh, make sure that the people know who's going to be on the team. Make sure that they've worked together. Or if they, uh, if they are just starting out, make sure that the responsibilities are small so that that trust can grow. All right, so um, low performance is a is an issue that you can measure, you can benchmark it, you can identify it early on. And um, yeah, second last slide. There's our positive team building in indicators, all right, so really high performance, that's what we want. Remember what we said, do we want a B-class opportunity with an A-class team or do we want an A-class opportunity with a B-class team? All right, so remember, surround yourself with people that uh, you want to work with, surround yourself with people that can actually do the work, all right, other people's resources. There used to be a well, there's, there used to be a movie called Other People's Money. It's by uh, Danny DeVito. If you guys are having sleepless nights on the weekend, maybe go and see if you can rent that movie. It's all about taking other people's resources and making it work for yourself. Right? In our industry, very important. All right. all right, and then the last slide for tonight. This is just I'm not going to talk about it, but this is a typical idea of um, staff development, you know, these are the things that we can talk about, you know, what's our plan for the next five years, what's your short term plan, where do you want to be, you know, this is this typical uh, KPI or performance review type plan that we spoke about earlier on, you know, where is the company going, where do you want to go at the end of the day, so make sure that, you know, you guys are all young and, um, and full of energy and starting out in the industry, make sure that you plan your career carefully. All right, so make sure that you plan your career carefully. Yes, of course, it's fine to make uh, mistakes. and It's actually fine to make a lot of mistakes because that's just part of, of who we are. Our, our mistakes and experiences define us at the end of the day. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about the HR stuff and professional organizations for tonight. Any questions from anybody? Any questions? Now would be a good time to ask those questions. No questions? If you don't have any questions, uh, Red Cross means no questions. 
alternative you can just pipe it into the uh, into the chat box all right so I can see there's no questions from uh, Timothy nothing from Leslie uh, I, I don't have any uh, Michael you also don't have anything um, all right so um, so Benjamin has asked the question is, as a manager what are the biggest problems that you have faced and how did you overcome these um, this sounds like an interview question um, so basically one one of the projects that I worked on uh, as, as a reasonably young guy this was in 2001 um, I was uh, working for a, um, a food company and the food company is called Compass Group it still exists today it's the third largest employer in the UK and uh, they had a, a six weeks position in Kuwait just before the war broke out and I said oh well I don't have anything to do for the next six weeks I'll go and do that so I ended up going to Kuwait and um, they um, when I landed there we were 12 people working on this tremendously big project we had to um, you know mobilize kitchens and mobilize schools and hospitals uh, in the middle of the desert with uh, limited resources and I had um, I think it was maybe 15 different cultures working together All right, so we had third country nationals in in the country we had Kuwaitis we had Iraqis we had Pakistanis and um, just just trying to manage that old game where you have all the different cultures you know just uh, different things means different things for all these cultures you know so a, a good example would just be the the site toilets that we had on site you know we use those those portable toilets in the middle of the desert and this one day was a particularly trying day for me I must have ate something that didn't agree with me so I ran to one of these um, portable units and only to discover that that somebody had beaten me to it and uh, there was there was really shit everywhere so it was really bad and later on we discovered that you know because of the different cultures um, the way that they you know the Pakistanis used the toilets you know they would you know stand on the sides or stand on the roof and squat on the inside and they would just do the most amazing things you know so in a laughable sense that taught me a little bit about you know dealing with other types of people um, I've also slowed down a lot if you um, if you ask uh, Lachlan to ask Jan in the old days I used to be a, a very authoritarian type person make decisions snap decisions um, I've calmed down quite a lot um, you know, listen to other people it must be common amongst um, South Africans uh, just because I know Jan still quite um, authoritarian like um, in, in the way he manages people yeah no, it's, it's, it, it, I think so you know um, I remember that that same project uh, we had a lot of we were, the client was the Department of Defense the US Department of Defense and you know after the third third day they came over to me and asked me if I can please you know talk uh, in you know talk a little bit slower and, and quieter because you know they, they perceive me as being very aggressive and I think that must be a South African thing you know but, but young young specifically he's always been like that you know don't let him fool you um, he's always shouted and screamed and you know he used to come to class in thongs and you know vests <laughs> and stuff like that and never never attended economics we had economics one and two and he you know sort of halfway through the class now it's time for gym and off he went you know so uh, yeah he, he he maintains to me that he he was always a uh, power lifter he used to lift um weights a fair bit he reckons <laughs> that's right yeah that's right he, but, but yeah uh, yeah you should next week bring a photo i'm not sure what he looks like now i'll go and see if i can find some of the student photos um, yeah email one through to me if you yeah he used to be a big, really, really big guy. Email one through in any case, Jos. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I find, okay. All right, so um, Mitchell, you've asked a question. Uh, what are the rate boxes below everybody's forum post and what, what are we meant? No, all right, so let's have a quick look at that one. That's a good question. So what I might do is I might share my desktop with you guys and let's see if I can go to um, into that so initially you would have seen that a few of you guys got 
a, a few funny write-ups on the first post. All right, so there you can see. I'll just uh, stop here at, at Ben's uh, Ben's listing. Um, see if I can make it nice and big. So I take it that you are referring to. Let's just grab this and move it out of the way. I take it that you are referring to the maximum rating over here, and what you can see that the 10 is the the final result. All right, so. Maximum rating for these forums means that whatever is the highest mark that you've achieved, that's the one that goes through to the gradebook. Now you'll see there's a four, and unfortunately that four shouldn't actually be there. I've only discovered it too late. But what I'll do is I'll open up this page for you, and you can see there that in this case uh, there were four people that sort of uh, rated uh, Benjamin, so James, myself, Carl. And you, uh, Mitch, you, you've also rated there 10 out of 10. Um, so that means you know we've we've all had a look at it. But if you look at later postings, I've changed. I've actually now changed the system to not allow you guys to do it. I hope it worked. Um, let's see if it's worked. Well, it seems to still allow you guys to do it. All right. But in any case, there you can see that's that's what the answer is. I'll have to I'll have to have a look at that. Um, why it comes through that you guys can still write it? It's not supposed to allow you guys to do it. But there's there's the honest answer that you've got. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes I just uh, no no. Let's uh, you definitely didn't. Well, the first but you cannot fail the first post. I would never do that. Uh, you can fail the first quiz though. Um, because that's out of my control, I won't. Uh, yeah. So, so the big thing that you have to look at is that first mark, the maximum rating there should be. Uh, that's the the result that goes through to the grade book, all right? And uh, that's going to be the first one then. All right. All right. Do we have any other questions? Any other questions from anybody? I'll clear the screen. So Red Cross, no. Um, all right, so nothing from Ben, nothing from Mitchell, all right, nothing from Michael, so we should be okay. Last one, I'll see what I can do about those photos. And all right, so if that's the case, I might um, stop the recording for tonight. Recording stopped. All right, so there's the recording has now stopped, and I'll go and investigate why you guys can still grade your own. Posts. It's not supposed to work like that. So if you uh, if you want a good score for the first post, maybe now is the time to go in there and give yourself a ten. Uh, all right, great stuff. Thanks everybody. I'll see you guys next week.